Why do the ocean and seas matter? When we think about the issues we face as a result of climate change, it's important to remember that our oceans need to be clean and protected to avoid the most severe issues that climate change is causing globally. Our oceans feed us, regulate our climate, and generate much of the oxygen that we breathe. We sometimes overlook the need for a clean and protected ocean when we think about sustainability. But for many people, the ocean is their playground where they go to escape life's challenges and reconnect with nature. On Sustainability Champions, we speak with people who are contributing to a more sustainable future to help protect our environment and the planet. And on today's episode, I interview another amazing champion who's doing just that. Introducing Ben Ridding, the founder of Ulu Dry Bags, a company that specializes in making waterproof backpacks and tow floats. Ben is on a mission to make all of his products from 100% ocean-bound plastic bottles. This is how he and the team at Ulu ensure they're making a real difference when it comes to protecting the ocean from plastic. In this episode, Ben states that he doesn't consider himself a sustainability champion, but rather someone who's eco-conscious, someone who wants to use common sense to help address the plastic pollution that's affecting our seas. This is an interesting episode with some great insights from Ben. I hope you enjoy this weekend's podcast interview with Ben Ridding from Ulu. Hey, Ben, thanks so much for joining us on the Sustainability Champions podcast. Great to have you on the show. Cheers, Daniel. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> Absolutely. So the way I like to start these calls is really just with a with an overview uh, so we can get an understanding and some context on, on the work you're doing. So can you share kind of like the elevator pitch, if you will, on what exactly is Ulu? Sure. Um, well, Ulu is all about keeping people safe in the ocean and doing everything that we can to help to protect it. Uh, the safety part of the ocean and the products that we're making comes from my background. I used to work here in the UK um, as a lifeguard on the beaches and then used to spend the winters traveling a bit further afield where it's warmer and lifeguard on the beaches of Western Australia. But obviously I've got a bit of sort of beach and ocean and water safety knowledge that goes into what we're producing. Um, for myself as well, personally, the ocean and the sea is somewhere that I go daily, whether that's just for a walk on the beach, to be near the sea, having a cold water dip at sunrise, open water swimming, stand up paddle boarding. Um, you know, the, the ocean is something that I use daily to sort of cancel out the noise and, you know, everything else that's going on in the world and, and for my own mental health. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that's always a very positive experience, except if you do see rubbish or litter in the sea, then that experience can become a bit more negative. But um, I, I won't I won't go into that too much more now. We'll, we'll go into that later, if that's cool. Mm -hmm. Um. And also the word, a lot of people ask me, you know, what does Ulu mean? And um, it means many different things all over the world. Uh, what we take from it is its meanings in Hawaiian, where it means to inspire or to grow. Um, and also in Indonesian, it means the edge of the land, which mm. represents pretty well where we're from, sort of, you know, Cornwall's down in the very southwestern tip of the UK, right sort of stuck out there on the edge. Um, all, all of the products that we're sort of producing and designing and making uh, they're all designed to sort of you know inspire people to interact with the ocean and to, you know re really get more connection out of th their their time in the water you know that and that whole experience so that's a lot of what's going on in the design our lead product my favorite one uh is the aquatrek 36 which is a really cool backpack uh, with a removable harness uh it's made from recycled plastic bottles uh you can swim with it kayak with it uh, i'll tell you a bit more about it later on but uh yeah it's, it's, it's a really cool design backpack that we came up with and um yeah started selling last year nice well that sounds like a very interesting conversation ahead and so <laughs> There, you started by saying two things, which is that basically to summarize that you like to, that Ulu, the company at least, is keeping people safe and protecting the ocean. So um, it seems to make sense to kind of split the conversation in, in almost two sections by, yeah. let's start with, with people because ultimately that's the product and that's that's who's, you know, yeah. what, what you're selling really. So when you say keeping people safe, what does that mean and, and how do you do it? Um, we started off in open water swimming. So obviously, if you're on your own with no equipment, there's 
for different people in different skill levels that you're in the ocean the oceans this you know this alien environment that there's always a safety element there you know nobody's a, a a master of the oceans, if you like, or a conqueror of the seas. Um, you, you always, it always helps to have something else, or you know, a piece of kit or a piece of equipment to help keep you safe. Hopefully, you never need it. But what we've tried to do is, in our designs, incorporate features that, should you need them, or if you did get into trouble, they would help you if you were going to get rescued, or you know, had people searching for you, or you had to raise the alarm and call for help. So those are the sort of the features, you know, the design aspects I'm I'm talking about there. Can you give some like actual specific examples? I, yeah. I mean, what what specifically do you mean? Yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of design features, uh, one of our first products was what's known as a tow float. And that's a product that when you're swimming in open water, you basically tow it behind you. It's inflatable. Mm -hmm. It's an inflatable dry bag. So you can put a mobile phone in it in a waterproof case. So if you get into trouble, you can take a phone out. You've got a means of calling for help. And um, we've also got a light attachment on the top of the bag. So, you know, if, if it's low light conditions, you can add a light there. So it makes it easier for other water users to see you or you be seen by other water users. Um, with towing them behind you as well in the sea, it means that it's much easier to spot one another. So mm -hmm. it's much easier to, you know, not swim off in a different direction, that, you know, which I like to do. So it makes it <laughs> much easier to keep an eye on, you know, other people that are in the water with you. We also use SOLAS, which stands for Safety of Lives at Sea. And we, all of our products have SOLAS reflective strips on them. And um, mm -hmm. that came about uh, from a stand-up paddleboarder in uh, Wales. And uh, th they were out searching for this guy. He he'd got into trouble. He hadn't come back home. They had a helicopter looking for him and a lifeboat looking for him. It was just getting dusk, you know, going into, the going into nighttime. They couldn't find him. When they stopped to make a new search pattern and work out how they were going to search next, he ended up floating up beside the lifeboat. Now, if he'd have had some solas reflective material on some of his equipment, whether that was, you know, on his shoulder, you know, on his dry bag, on his stand up paddleboard, the search and rescue light would have picked him up. You know, this stuff under these rescue lights, it literally, it lights up like a Christmas tree. Um, had he had some of that on him, he would have been much easier to see and much easier to find. So wow. that's where that sort of design feature comes in there. So the, yeah, and thank you for that. So so basically these, the your products are specifically for people who are open water swimming and need, or, or Go on, you're about to say something. Yeah, well, um, is it best if I talk you through the products? Yeah, yeah please, uh, absolutely. So, so um, we got three three main products: the tow float, which is the one I was just sort of discussing with you, mm -hmm. which is for open water swimming. Um, we also made a development or like a an advancement of the tow float, if you like, with um, a waterproof zipper, so the bag's submersible, and it also has a GoPro or an action camera mm -hmm. mount on the front. Cool. Uh, like you know all the time whenever you're swimming outdoors you know sunrises sunsets some beautiful locations so we wanted to be able to capture that so um the, the gopro mount was a really cool addition there um but the obviously that's for open water swimming and the backpack is uh was designed for open water swimming but has been used probably by 10 or 15 percent open water swimmers in the last year and has been used by all sorts of other people always on the water and on the ocean or sometimes hiking and in the mountains but you know the safety features that we built into it means it's been used by all sorts of other people and of course they're all waterproof because the whole point is that it's for the water yeah that's it and the backpack has ipx7 rated waterproof zippers which means that you can hold it for half an hour one meter below water without any ingress so wow. that was one of the things that obviously we wanted was was confidence in the equipment that you know, you're out, especially if you're out in the sea and swimming in, and it's bouncy and choppy that everything that you've got inside will stay dry. Yeah. I, I mean, I can imagine, you know, if you're also going for a hike somewhere and it starts raining, great use case as well. You just don't want to have to worry about any of your stuff getting wet. Um, yeah. and, and, um, okay. And so, okay. So that is how you keep people safe. So, uh, that makes that makes sense because ultimately the whole the product is designed to 
keep important things. And yeah. also there's all sorts of features that are there to um, protect you in the case of any emergency that hopefully you don't need. Yeah, including high visibility material, which is probably one worth noting. Um, is that different than the Solas? Uh, yeah, so the the backpack is orange. Um, oh, if you look at most of the lifeboats in the world, um, and you know Coast Guard boats, I've also you know a lot of them use orange or yellow. They're mm -hmm. the two of the most easiest colours to see at sea. So with, with the backpack, that that's orange. So it it's it's the most visible colour that you can see when you're bouncing around in the water. Yeah, and I mean that makes a lot of sense. I, yeah, yeah, when you're when you're swimming in like especially the ocean where there's waves, you disappear. You know, you're this tiny little impossible to see blob that's sort of yeah. floating. And um, yeah, if there's a boat or anything, yeah. there's no way to spot you. Yeah, especially if they've got sun in their eyes. But I mean, even if you're swimming with somebody side by side and there's a bit of swell and chop, it's amazing how quickly you can lose one another. And, you know, it doesn't right. take much wind to create a bit of swell and chop to for them to disappear. Whereas with these tow floats, because they sit on top of the water, you know, even if they're down in a trough that that's staying on top of the water. So it, it keeps you visible. And you mentioned at the beginning, your favorite product, um, which you said we'll talk about later. What, what is your favorite? My, my favorite product is the, the Aquatrek 36, the backpack. Um, and, and that's more of a, a, like a hybrid of the other products, if you like, because it, it was designed for open water swimming. In Cornwall, we've got amazing, it's quite a cool spot because we've got rough conditions up on the north coast. So mm -hmm. you can surf and, you know, you've got all the waves and the south coast is, you know, flat, calm waters and beautiful. Every little sort of cove and bay looks totally different. And what I wanted to do with my friends that, you know, I lifeguarded with we, as we got into exploring the south coast more, we wanted to swim and but be able to take all of our kit with us. So rather than sort of jumping in at one spot and then going for a swim and then having to turn around and come back again, it was much more fun and exciting to be able to sort of hike along the coast path, do a bit of a recce of where we were going, suss out, you know, areas that might look cool, get changed, chuck all of our kit inside this backpack, take the harness off so it floats and stays above the water tow it behind us know that everything's going to stay dry and and then it gets to sort of explore coming back so you made this product specifically for yourself this is how the whole thing started yeah it is how it all started because there's nothing else on the market like that that would sort of carry all of your kit like that that would keep everything waterproof um but it's actually quite cool with how the, the sort of the safety features, if you like, with it being waterproof, the orange visibility, the solar strips on it, you know, being able to attach safety whistles. It's really interesting how many other people have um, have been using it. And I can run you through a few of them if you'd like. Or... Yeah, let's go. Absolutely. Cool. Um, yeah, last year we had it used by some paramedics that were keeping their kit dry. Oh, wow. um, also some flood response teams in the UK, they were trialing it. So that was really cool. Um, it's been out on a few expeditions recently as well. A year before last, Jeff Allen, an explorer, he was out in Greenland following the footsteps of a guy called Gino Watkins, who um, this was about 1930, took about 14 men to survey the, the east coast of Greenland and they they didn't come back. But he, he was out on a kayak sort of exploring, like did the same sailing routes and everything else that Gino Watkins did. And he used it as an emergency bailout pack. So what that means is he had it strapped to the back of his kayak. And um, if, you know, you imagine this is, you know, out with all the icebergs and everything else, like really cool when you see your product there and see it being used in this environment. Um, but, you know, if they had a problem, it was going to keep everything dry, inflatable. They could tow it with them to get to safety. So it was a it was an emer emergency bailout bag. And uh, we had another guy, Jack, um, and he did a he did a tour on kayaks again in the Pacific Northwest. He went from Alaska down to Seattle. Wow. Um, yeah, doing a load of research on about how you know communities in that area are living sustainably. But I mean, he had some really cool shots of you know really remote places. And again, he used it as an emergency bailout bag, and uh, and had it hoisted up a few trees uh, to keep food away from bears and stuff a few pictures he sent us that was uh that was quite cool <laughs> that is cool how big are the, how big is this this is the aqua track 36 that you yeah have. yeah it's, it's 36 liters um, okay. and it, obviously the, the, the harness is removable so that can go inside but the next generation 
um, which will be launching around about May time. That, that, that features more of a Mole system on the outside. So if you want to, you can sort of attach more first aid kit to the outside. So if you need to keep everything dry on the insides, you know, you can still access, you know, mobile phone, first aid kit, other pieces from the outside. Makes sense. And yeah. if we, well, yeah, first of all, thanks for, for sharing those great stories. It's wonderful. I would imagine <laughs> that so, feeling. I'm a bit being, excited when I'm talking about it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's cool. I mean, it's, you know, I would imagine it, it feels like that feeling is so, such a rush to be able to see your product that you've been working on for, for a long time being yeah. actually used in, you know, intense conditions and the way it was meant to be. And, and people are actually hopefully enjoying it and, and, you know, making the most of it and, and getting value from it. That must yeah, be really exciting. Absolutely. If we, if we go to the other side now in terms of protecting the ocean, because you said yeah. at the beginning, you know, the ocean is a very healing place uh, for you um, yeah. emotionally and, and mentally. And, and I can completely relate when, you know, a day at the beach, even if it's just a casual place, it's, it's relaxing. It's, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you start to see rubbish or litter in the sea, it can be disheartening and it really does ruin the experience. So protecting the ocean is a very important part for uh, Ulu and, and for, you know, for the work that you're doing. So um, I, I guess I have two questions. Number one, uh, and then this is kind of the bigger topic is why is protecting the ocean so important? And then we'll, we'll go to the other question about what you actually do at Ulu to protect the ocean. But what, 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 you know, why is the ocean so important for us to protect? Um, I think the main reason, I mean, for me personally, it's, uh, it's to be totally honest, it's selfish reasons. And, you know, like I said, the, the, the ocean is an amazing healing place, you know, a place of inspiration. And um, this is where I hope you got one of those bleeper buttons because <laughs> you know, as, as soon as you do see some waste or some trash in the water, it, it, it can change that whole experience. You know, it really does bring up emotions of frustration, anger, disappointment, and really does... Um, annoy you so you don't have to use the bleeper um yeah so i mean every, everything i'm doing at ulu is uh i guess i'm not i'm not trying to be a sustainability champion if you like it's just more sort of common sense you know i, I spent a lot of time in the water i've also seen a lot of things in the ocean you know spent a lot of time in asia traveling um and everything I'm piecing together now has is, is, is been really good to be able to sort of see a lot of the problems firsthand and then try and help create or be a part of the solution. But it's all just sort of common sense things. I, I've got a load of different ways I could discuss with you as well of, you know, everything that we're doing ourselves or, you know, ourselves with the product. Um, I've also got a very close relationship with the factory that I work with. Um, so, you know, I, I've been doing a lot there to try and influence them to have more sustainable practices in their manufacturing. Um, so then that they can use that as a USP, if you like, when they're attracting more customers. Uh, I, you know, I worked with them in Europe doing some of their marketing and helping them at exhibitions. And it's really interesting how they then see what you know, how people are more interested in sustainability now by me saying, you know, listen, look, look at these products you're using to have your lunch with, you know, this isn't a state sustainable. What about this solution? You know, and having them understand that they can then, you know, use that as a marketing point to attract mm -hmm. more customers. And so, yeah, it all, all takes a bit of time, but it's all, all moving in the right direction. Yeah. Well, I think that, answer that you just said leads perfectly to to the next question which is what exactly are you doing because your position in a, in a you have a very great you're in a very great good spot to make an impact yeah um so initially working with recycled plastic bottles in our products mm -hmm. um it's probably easier if i give you a bit of a breakdown on, on the positives and the negatives of working with recycled plastic bottles and yeah, why that. I'm sort of, you know, trying to move away from that and moving mm -hmm. down a different direction. Okay. Um, yeah, so to give you a bit of an overview, <laughs> when I picture, when you picture a product being made or, you know, if we're both consumers and we're going to buy a product that's made from recycled plastic bottles, for me, I, I get that picture in my head of an, an empty drinks bottle or something blowing down the street. We're being part of the solution of stopping that, you know, 
if I'm swimming or on a stand-up paddleboard and you see some junk in the sea, you're, you're being part of that solution. That That's the sort of image. Um, and when we see made from recycled plastic bottles on, you know, on the products we're going to purchase, that that's the sort of image that we're, that we're conjuring up, if you like, or that I'm conjuring up anyway. Um, plastic bottles, it's probably easier if I give you the, the terminology, first of all, because if I start talking about PET and our PET, you'll probably think, Ben, what are you on about? Um, vir virgin pets or the plastic bottles, if you like, are made from PET material. When that's recycled, it's called our PET. Now, PET is called or stands for polyethylene terephthalate. So it's a bit of a tongue twister, that one. Um, so it's the polyethylene terephthalate. That's the virgin pet, if you like, the, the original plastic bottle. And then when it's recycled, it's our pet. Now, when I started off, obviously, I wanted to use recycled plastic bottles because it would be part of that solution. Um, as I've got deeper and deeper involved on this journey with, you know, developing the brand, I found one of the biggest issues is scrutiny in the supply chain because it's much cheaper to make a product from virgin pet. So yeah, the, the cost of the product goes up if it's made from our pet. So manufacturers will naturally want to increase their profit margins. So the easiest way for them to do that is to use virgin pets. Um, you know, made from recycled plastic bottles, sure. 100%, that's what we kind of believe or think, or is it 50%? Is it 10%? Is it 5%? And it's actually quite difficult to get an accurate answer you know that there are independent companies now that will verify you know what what percentage of our pet is in a product but it's not common practice and it's, it's sometimes it's a bit easier said than done mm. uh i've got a very good relationship with the factory i work with um they've got their material supplier they've got their yarn supplier when you come in and start trying to disrupt that supply chain it it you know, it, it can be a tricky or it takes a bit of time for, for those changes to happen. Um, so, so that's the main issue, really, is scrutiny. And another problem we've come across is um, when I said vir virgin pet is cheaper to manufacture from, you know, plastic bottles might be produced and then recycled and then turned into products. And, of course, they are made from 100% recycled plastic bottles, but it's not the it's, it's not the stuff that's coming out of the ocean that I picture, you know, it's sort of marketing spiel and everything else mm -hmm. being clever. And for, for me personally, you know, I, I'm interested in doing things that I can to be as you know sustainable as possible, if you like. But you know, to, but to actually have a bit of impact and have some you know influence here over over what's going on. Uh, okay. If you would like, to... just um, just on that point with with recycled pet, the um, that recycled plastic. So it's, I mean, it is recycled bottles. It's just um, or plastic bottles. But it's what you're saying is it's not going to be the stuff that's being pulled out of the ocean. It's like something that goes into your recycling bin and goes through that supply chain. Or yeah, or yeah. what I'm saying is it's very hard to identify um, where exactly that. The, the R pet has originally come from and it's very difficult to do tests once a product's been made to mm. then identify and say right this is this percentage R pet but you know that there are the independent companies now that will verify that for you but it's not sort of commonplace and common practice so it's it's actually quite difficult to get all of the supply chain to 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 meet up and balance out if you like to know exactly and, and it, it it is possible, and this is something that we're doing in the future with the ocean bound plastics. Mm -hmm. But it's um, you know, it, for me, I guess when I started this journey, I was like, great, recycled plastic bottles, brilliant. And, you know, this is the direction that you start going down. And it's only once you start working in that area that you start to understand more about the manufacturing processes. And it's only from wanting to understand more about what's going into our products and how we can do to, you know, constantly keep improving that you just sort of keep peeling back a layer of the onion, if you like, um, so it, with the sustainability side. Yeah. And and that's, it's a really interesting perspective because what you're basically saying is if what it sounds like to me, if I wanted to start my own company where I start making a product out of recycled plastic, uh, I, I'm going to start interviewing, I suppose, factories to see, Hey, can you, can you 
you know, factory, can you make this product for me out of 100% recycled plastic? And they'll say, yes. And you'll be like, well, that doesn't sound very confident. Why don't you know 100% how much? And they say, well, our suppliers tell us, but we're not 100% clear. They say it is, but there's no way for us to verify or double check that. And so basically what you realize is you want to make a product that's made out of 100% plastic, but there's no way for you to actually know one for sure as as you, um, yeah. you know, whether or not it is. Is is that what you're saying? Yeah, a- a- absolutely. And that is starting to change now. Okay. Um, and, it, it, and it is going to become easier because obviously this is a problem that's arisen. Um, so it, it is getting solved. But yeah, that that's absolutely the issue. That's crazy. I mean, that makes life so much more difficult. Um, it does. <laughs> yeah, especially because all you want to do is just use recycled plastic. Yeah. Uh, the, the good news is, is that obviously, you know, p- people are becoming more environmentally conscious. So there is a lot more demand right. for the more sustainable products, uh, you know, that all of the factories are hearing that. So it might take a bit of time, but they are responding. Another interesting fact for you, and this is when I talk about, you know, the picture of the plastic bottle that's in my head, you know, in the ocean or um, 80% of the world's plastic bottles and, and waste actually comes from Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only 20% rest of the world. Now, the reason that's interesting is because most of the world's factories or most products in the world are manufactured in Asia. So you've got all of the materials there that can then be you know ground up and recycled and then turned into products. And this gives you more of a sort of a, an idea of, of the issues is, um, I think, was it in 2020, only 4% of Asia's plastics were recycled. Wow. And in 2021, that went up to 6%. And that was from the Singapore uh, National Environment Agency. Um, so, you know, it's gone from 4% to 6%. But if you compare that to a country like Germany, uh, they, they're they around 60, 66%. So it, it, that just gives you an idea of the sort of the scale of this is where a lot of the plastic bottle pollution is in the world. This is how much is getting recycled at the moment. You know, how do we go about getting that number up and solving that problem? As far as what's next for Ulu, because you, you mentioned already um, that you're focusing on ocean bound plastics. And actually at the, at the beginning, um, when we started talking about uh, recycled plastic bottles, you said that you're moving away from it. Yeah. So what, what is next for Ulu and what are you focusing on now? Um, so uh, to say I was moving away from recycled plastic bottles, what I'm doing is moving more towards traceability throughout the mm-hmm. supply chain. Mm-hmm. Um, so sure, that is going to be recycled plastic bottles. But what I'm looking at is more of the ocean bound plastics and the plastic bottles that end up in the waterways, you know, or on their way to the ocean in Asia. Uh, so, yeah, it is still plastic bottles. But what I want to be able to do in the future, and, and this will be possible, is be able to collect a bag of rubbish you know, off the beaches, follow that right the way through to it being cleaned, the materials being broken down, going to the yarn factory, the yarn being produced, the, you know, the other materials going on it to our backpacks being produced and then getting out to the end consumer. So I'll be working on more batch numbers. So we'll be able to identify that batch of, you know, verified ocean bound plastic waste is then come into this batch of material into this x products on this run so we've got a lot more traceability right the way through the supply chain from from start to finish that's really cool i mean two things on that um uh first of all i think from a from a marketing perspective you know if i'm going to be buying an ulu bag or backpack or, or tow float it would be amazing to have a little card in there that says this this tow float or this bag was made from bottles that were picked up here with like a little GPS coordinate, you know, like that would be so yeah. cool. You know, that... I, 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 I want to be collecting the bags of rubbish. I, I want to be collecting the bags of rubbish, you know, for that first batch of, you know, have many backpacks and be a part of that whole process yeah. and see it going through. And that'd be, yeah, really cool. That, I mean, and as from the consumer's point of view, especially someone who cares about sustainability, I, I would absolutely love to know, like this is real imp- impact, which is, which is yeah. to your point about traceability. 
ability. Um, the other thing, and, and this is a question for you, is that I, I recently discovered that uh, a lot of the uh, plastic waste in the ocean is actually um, what are called ghost nets, meaning yeah. you know from fishing vessels, they just... I don't know a whole lot about it, but from what I've heard, basically a fishing vessel is done with the net and it's just too much effort, I guess, to bring the net back into the boat or ship. And so they just cut it off. I actually don't really understand how it works, but it sounds crazy. And so you have all of these nets just floating around and they're still catching things and turtles and dolphins and everything you can think of just gets caught in these nets that are just discarded. Um, but there are, I've seen companies who are taking these nets and doing the same thing as you're talking about with the plastic and collecting the net and then turning it into plastic or, or into yarn, which then you can use it for something else. Is that something that you're you're looking into as well or, or considering? It is. Yeah. I've got some uh, friends also in Cornwall who are doing the same thing with the, with the nets that are washing up on the Cornish yeah. beaches. So they're um, collecting all of those. And at the moment, they're turning them into sunglasses. Oh, but cool. Yeah, I've got some plans to, you know, turn them into safety whistles and, you know, see what we can do there for to to bring those elements of um, pieces into the kit as well. Yeah, I think it's such an opportunity. What yeah, are you gonna say? definitely. Yeah, it's um, it, it's such an opportunity, but it's this is where the excitement for me comes in because it's so much more hands on. And, you know, as I keep talking about traceability, being able to see every step of the process you know if you can be there on a rainy day on the beach and seeing the material coming off the beach and know it's going into that batch of products that that's really cool you know you, you know that there's no asking somebody you know where did this come from what percentage and then getting an answer from you know it's yeah. um it's a cool thing to be able to do yeah i think back to your your point about you know consumers are starting to demand for uh, recycled and kind of these sustainable materials, what you're doing by sort of focusing on the traceability is you're also pressuring um, other businesses to be more transparent in terms of how this works. And, and you're actually doing a, a you're playing a crucial role in, in reducing greenwashing because you're saying, I'm not going to buy your product until I can get a very clear and very basically guarantee that yeah. the product is what you say it is and and that you can demonstrate and prove to me that it comes from a specific source and it's a specific type of material and without that i'm not going to be buying your product um and that's how supply and demand works and that's what's that's why personally i believe capitalism is the answer to solving um all the in environmental challenges because you as an individual have that option to make those changes Absolutely. And it's now, you know, when I was talking about, you know, the, the materials being verified, it's not easy, but it is possible because it's possible. It's, you know, who's going to be winning the business? It's the people that do have the verified materials. So exactly. then the rest of the factories have to to, to catch up. Exactly. And, and rise up to that standard. Yeah. Um, well, this is, uh, it's really great to hear, uh, Ben, the work that you're doing and, and your passion for the ocean and for keeping people safe while while protecting the environment. So um, where, if people want to learn more about Ulu or, or buy a tow float or, or one of your bags, where's the best place for them to go to, to find more? Um, sure. We've got a website, which is www.ulu-drybags.com um, or on Instagram, again, at Ulu Dry Bags. But um, one thing I am interested in is anybody else else who um if this resonates with anybody to um get in touch with me personally on ben at uludrybags.com um i found m most of the best um things on this journey if you like of building a brand have happened you know with talking to other people within industries or sustainability and helping each other out so yeah if anybody wants to get in touch that's my email address and um drop me a line well that's awesome and, and for anyone who's listening and, and didn't read the the name ulu is spelled U L U. So three letters, very easy. And uh, yeah, uludrybags.com. And like Ben just said, just to be uh, repetitive, Ben at uludrybags.com is how you can reach Ben directly. Well, Ben, thank you again very much for your time and for going through this, uh, your your journey, your story, and and uh, the work that you're doing. It's it's inspiring to hear how you know you saw a, a, a challenge, a personal challenge in terms of just how you wanted to uh, swim and, and enjoy your time at the beach. And you've turned it into an opportunity to, to make an impact both for people and, and the planet. So thanks very much for, for talking us through that. Cheers, Daniel. Thanks for your time. Thank you.